Take a deep, relaxing breath. No, seriously, no cruel jokes this time, I promise. Close your eyes and take a moment to focus on the slow, rhythmic movement of your diaphragm. What you're doing right now is a very basic form of simple meditation, where external stimuli, except for my voice of course, is blocked out and all that exists is your being, your breath. Now take a moment to think about the other things that are happening to your body. You probably notice your breathing has slowed down, become deeper, your heart has slowed, and it's not beating as hard. When done properly, meditation can stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system, which, as we described in the first session, is the rest and digest part of the autonomic nervous system. Now it's time to cover the anatomy of the parasympathetic nervous system. Okay, time to open your eyes and brace yourself. Creepy intro music about to start. Time to finish up our talk of the autonomic nervous system with a look at the parasympathetic nervous system. Again, this is the yin to the sympathetic nervous system's yang. Despite being polar opposites to one another, they actually work in a coordinated fashion to precisely regulate the body's automatic functions, such as heart rate, blood pressure, and the distribution of blood throughout the body. Before we begin, let's do a quick review of the similarities and differences between the two systems. Remember that, unlike the somatic nervous system, both the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems consist of two neurons in series, which communicate through a synapse. These are designated as the presynaptic and postsynaptic neurons. In the case of the sympathetic nervous system, the presynaptic axon tended to be much shorter than the postsynaptic axon. As we're going to see, it can be confusing because the postsynaptic sympathetic axon will often pair up with the parasympathetics traveling to the same organ. They'll therefore pass through these ganglia, but they won't synapse here because the sympathetic already synapsed further upstream. So here are the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems combined. Wow, that does look confusing. Let's simplify this a little bit. There we go. Once again, as with the sympathetics in the previous segment, the presynaptic axons are shown in red, while the postsynaptic are shown in black. Notice, like we just said, that the postsynaptic axons are much shorter than the presynaptic. Also notice how the parasympathetic outflow is restricted to four separate cranial nerves and to the sacral region of the spinal cord. This is therefore where the term craniosacral outflow comes from. We're going to start by looking at three separate nerve tracts that supply parasympathetic innervation to structures within the head and neck. We'll begin by looking at the oculomotor nerve. Parasympathetic neurons associated with the oculomotor nerve play a role in pupillary diameter and lens accommodation. Presynaptic parasympathetic fibers originate from the Edinger-Westphal nucleus within the brainstem. From there, they merge with the oculomotor nerve to enter the orbit through the superior orbital fissure. Once in the eye, these fibers jump off the oculomotor nerve and catch a ride with the trigeminal nerve to reach the ciliary ganglion, which houses the postsynaptic cell bodies. Following the synapse, the postsynaptic axons travel along short ciliary nerves which pierce the scleral coat of the eyeball and run forwards in the pericordal space to enter the ciliary muscle and the sphincter pupillae. They serve to contract the sphincter pupillae muscle to decrease pupillary diameter as occurs when the eye is exposed to light. They also promote contraction of the ciliary muscle, which decreases the tension in the suspensory ligaments of the lens, increasing the lens thickness to focus on closer objects. Now, if you recall from our previous session, sympathetic fibers also pass into the eye through both short and long ciliary nerves. Again, these will counter the effect of the sympathetic fibers, contracting the radiating fibers of the iris to increase pupillary diameter and relax the ciliary muscles, which stretches the lens to bring focus on objects further away. 
But remember, the sympathetic axons entering the orbit are already postsynaptic. The synapse took place in the superior cervical ganglion. So while some of these fibers pass through the ciliary ganglion, they won't synapse here like the parasympathetic do. Next, we look at the parasympathetics off the facial nerve. This is the innervation that is responsible for the majority of glandular secretions in the head and neck region of the body. For this reason, we've coined the expression, the facial nerve makes the face wet. There are two parasympathetic ganglion that are important to the facial nerve, the pterygopalatine ganglion and the submandibular ganglion. The pterygopalatine ganglion is found deep in the face, inferior to the orbit and just lateral to the nasal cavity. It serves as a convergence point for various neural inputs, general sensation, sympathetic, and of course, parasympathetic innervation. From here, all three modalities project out to various regions of the head, including the nasal cavity and the roof of the oral cavity. One of these projections takes a particularly tortuous route along the lateral wall of the orbit to reach the lacrimal gland to regulate tear production. All parasympathetics entering the pterygopalatine ganglion arise from the facial nerve, reaching the ganglion through a branch known as the greater petrosal nerve. As we've seen with other parasympathetic ganglion, the pterygopalatine ganglion houses the cell bodies for the postsynaptic neurons. From this point, the fibers branch out to the nasal cavity and roof of the mouth to stimulate secretions from the glandular tissue found there. And in the case of the lacrimal gland, postganglionic fibers project along the lateral rim of the orbit to stimulate tear production. You don't need to worry too much about these pathways at the present moment. We will go into further detail with them in our discussion of the head and neck. Just have an appreciation for the parasympathetic distribution to these tissues. And of course, also remember that postganglionic sympathetic fibers which also pass through the pterygopalatine ganglion to reach the same tissues to decrease glandular secretions. So that takes care of our parasympathetic innervation to the roof of the mouth. But what about the floor? And in particular, what about the salivary glands that produce most of the secretions for the oral cavity? This is also the job of the facial nerve, but in this case, it's through a different nerve branch that takes an interesting path through the middle ear cavity to reach the mouth. Because of its close proximity to the tympanic membrane, or eardrum, along its path, this branch has been named the chordae tympani. Parasympathetic fibers pass through the chordae tympani to enter the submandibular ganglion at the floor of the mouth, which houses the postsynaptic cell bodies. These fibers pass into submandibular and sublingual salivary glands to increase secretions with eating. That takes care of most of the parasympathetics to the head, except for one last salivary gland, the parotid gland, located at the side of the face. This receives parasympathetics from the glossopharyngeal cranial nerve. These parasympathetic nerve fibers pass through a branch off the glossopharyngeal nerve known as the deep petrosal nerve to reach the otic ganglion, which contains postsynaptic nerve cell bodies. Postsynaptic fibers jump into the trigeminal nerve to reach the parotid duct. And again, postsynaptic sympathetic fibers will also pass into all three of the salivary glands we've discussed. That covers parasympathetic innervation to the head, but there's one other cranial nerve that carries parasympathetic fibers. This is the vagus nerve. The term vagus means wanderer, which describes the distribution of this nerve through the thorax and abdomen. This is, without question, the most extensively branched parasympathetic nerve we have. Parasympathetics serve the heart and lung in the thorax, which slow heart rate, lower blood pressure, and constrict airway passages. It also serves the foregut and midgut region, which stimulates digestive secretions and peristalsic contractions of the digestive tract. The hindgut region, which includes the descending and sigmoid colons, as well as the kidneys, urinary bladder, and reproductive organs, is served by the pelvic splanchnic nerves, which branch from the sacral region of the spinal cord, reaching their respective organs through the second, third, and fourth sacral nerves. 
That's going to do it for our discussion of the parasympathetic nervous system and for our discussion of the autonomic nervous system. There, that wasn't so bad, now was it? So until next time, this has been Dr. Stuart Ingalls. Enjoy the rest of your day.